Welcome to the program for the first time, Elizabeth Alvarez. Uh, Elizabeth is a student debt organiz uh, organizer, a uh, policy student uh, for the Debt Collective. Um, Astra, Elizabeth, thanks so much for joining us today. Hello. Hi. Um, all right, Astra, let's start with you. Just tell me the, um, uh, the, the, the history of the Debt Collective and sort of this, when this movement started gaining some traction. Yes, thanks so much for having me on. This is exciting. The Debt Collective is a union for debtors that has its roots in the Occupy Wall Street movement. During those days of Occupy, I just realized it's the 10th year anniversary this year, 2021, time flies. We actually organized uh, something called One Tea Day, a protest marking the day student debt surpassed $1 trillion. So now student debt stands at $1.7 trillion. If something doesn't happen, we're going to be protesting 2T Day under a Biden administration. So the idea is that our debts are somebody else's assets. They're a form of leverage. So we invite debtors to come together, just like workers come together in a labor union, to demand cancellation and to demand the provision of public services. So in this case, free college for all. Just you know what we had generations ago in this country, public quality education for those who want it so that we don't have student debt you know, destroying lives, it, 45 million debtors. And it's, uh, it's, you know, causing incredible stress of mind and body. People can't uh, plan for their futures. They can't plan for retirement. Seniors are getting their social security garnished. I mean, it's a, it's a crisis. And partly why the crisis is recognized now is because the debt collective has been pushing this issue since that, since those days in Zuccotti Park. So, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about uh, your story, because in, in, in many respects, it's, it's typical of, of, I guess, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, millions across the country in many respects. Yeah, thank you for having me, Sam. Um, so my story starts at St. John's University. Um, I come from um, an immigrant background. My family uh, migrated to this country in the uh, mid-90s. Um, and like many Americans, I was told, you know, go to school, um, everything will, will be okay. Um, as some people might know, um, St. John's University's uh, tuition is very, very high. Um, and I signed on um, these loans and now I'm about $80,000 uh, into, into student debt. Um, there I studied political science because of course I too wanted to, to have an impact on, you know, like the shaping of, of our, our country, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately, I, I, I've been um, settled by, by this debt. How, how much of that is principal at this point? I mean, uh, and how much of it is sort of just accruing, you know, interest? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I originally borrowed $40,000 and now it is, it's, it's not doubled. Um, I, I double checked my interest rates as um, I've been organizing with the debt collective and my my highest interest loan is 11 percent. Are, are you well, let me just ask you this question. You're not like 80 years are old, are you? I mean, like, <laughs> no, but it's like it, that is stunning amount of of interest. And we should say, like, I mean, you, you, you strike me as someone who's fairly young. I mean, most people do now at my age. But uh, but I mean, that's that's an extraordinary amount of money to have accumulated. How, how if you don't mind me asking, how long have you been out of college? Five years. That's nuts. I mean, I'm sorry. That's just absolutely nuts. Who owns your um, your debt, your your loan? Like who is making all of this money off of you? to presumably go to uh, a, a university, become a, a, a better citizen. I like to think that universities are doing that. I mean, who, who owns all that? Who, who, who's gonna get all that profit from you? Yeah, so my servicer is uh, Nelnet. Uh, they're one of the many um, servicers, um, including Sally Mae, et cetera. Yeah. Well, um, servicer, but I mean, who, who loans you the money? Oh, the, the, uh, the American government. Uh, these are all federal loans. This is such an important point. The vast majority, over 95% of student debt is held by the federal government. The federal government makes an enormous profit off of lending to students and it's completely unnecessary. That's not what the government's for. That's not what the state is for. However, that gives student debt its power. And this is why the debt collective focuses on it because all of this debt is owned by the federal government. The federal government can get rid of it. 
In fact, the debt collective is demanding that Joe Biden cancel all student debt using the authority he already has. It's called Compromise and Settlement Authority. It was granted by Congress to the Department of Education, to the executive branch back in 1965. The ability to create debt implies the ability to cancel it. And so this is one of the things that the Biden administration can solve right away without going through Congress, without dealing with Mitch McConnell and the obstructionist Republicans. And so it's a policy choice actually to perpetuate this harm. And you're so right to point out how, how impossible this math is for people. It's, this is not a rare story. <laughs> like this is like we're uh, you know we're we're all implicated in this. We're all basically you know a bunch of payday lenders. I mean honestly, this like the the idea that uh, that debt has doubled uh, in the years that you would have graduated. And and I want to I want to get back and I just want to just add to what you were saying, Astra, is that the authority that uh, Joe Biden exercised on day one when he um, continued the moratorium on collecting interest uh, through COVID is exactly the same authority that he could just, we could go in on a word doc, change a couple of the words, his signature would be just as valid. But I want to go back a little bit and talk a little bit about the 2015 student, uh, student uh, debt strike, uh, Astor. Just get a sense of how this has developed because I think it's difficult for people my age and older to sort of fully appreciate how things have changed dramatically in terms of the cost of of uh, of a college education, two or four year uh, education, uh, and also I think like the um, the availability of 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 outright grants and whatnot uh, for people. I think it's just very hard for some of the olds like myself to appreciate what younger people are facing. This is part of why it's so frustrating, I think, when older people say, oh, I can't believe young people want their loans canceled. It's like, well, I can't believe you got to go to college for free or basically you know, nothing. <laughs> and there is a brilliant. I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. will you please just remind people like when we say for free, like that's not this is not rhetoric. Like literally uh, 50 years ago. I mean, I'm not that old when you went to college. Um, there were plenty of opportunities to go for basically nothing. Exactly that, you know, or you could pay your tuition even at a private university with a part-time job that was paying minimum wage. So things have changed. And in fact, it was a political shift that many people, many historians credit to Ronald Reagan who wanted to attack the University of California public education system, which promised quality education, whether at community colleges, uh, state colleges or universities like Berkeley for free to, to its citizenry. So there was a right wing counterattack that was driven by racism and driven by business interests to say, let's not, let, let's not have college be a right, let's have it be a commodity and let's use student debt actually as a way to quiet down the students who were then engaged in social protests as we know. So what that did was created a student loan system with very perverse incentives and created the student debt crisis as we know it. What the debt collective did in 2015 was to begin organizing with a group of students who had attended a predatory for-profit college chain called Corinthian Colleges. For-profit colleges get federal money and then charge students huge sums to go for vocational degrees that are usually worthless. And Corinthians served hundreds of thousands of students a year. So these are massive institutions that attract mostly black and brown, working class, immigrant, veteran, first generation students, students who are vulnerable and poor to begin with, and then give them this incredible student debt with no opportunity at the end. And it's very important to note that these, the student loan system is the same, whether you're going to Uni University of Phoenix or Harvard, right? The back end, the money is, is it all, you follow the chains of it straight to the federal government. Long story short, 15 students calling themselves the Corinthian 15 went on a debt strike. We made a lot of noise about this. Their numbers swelled to the hundreds, then the thousands. The debt collective organized a very creative legal strategy. We ended up winning over a billion dollars of debt cancellation from the federal government for these students, changes to federal law. And we got the idea that mass student debt cancellation is out there. And that led to the research through one of our co-founders, Luke Karen the research on compromise and settlement. So we actually had a letter ready to go to Hillary Clinton when we thought she might be the president saying, cancel student debt, exactly right. With the signature, let's get rid of this problem. So that, that campaign has led to what we are doing now, which is the Biden Jubilee 100, 100 student debt strikers from all walks of life, all different educational backgrounds that, um, 
that Elizabeth is part of that are saying we demand full student debt cancellation within Biden's 100 days. That's what the 100 symbolically represent. So we are saying that people who are struggling under the weight of these loans shouldn't feel ashamed. They shouldn't, they shouldn't default in silence. They should say, we can't pay these loans. <laughs> we can't beat this game of the compound interest. And we won't pay because we shouldn't have to pay because education should be a right. And just to speak kind of the language of the politicians in D.C. who are a lot more concerned with economic growth, in my view, than kind of providing relief for people. Can you touch on what this would mean for the economy? Because my generation, you know, Elizabeth, I would assume we're of the same generation. Um, Home ownership for a lot of us is a fantasy, something like it's that's just out of reach because of the student debt that we've been saddled with as a generation um, and, and people older than us, us as well. Can you talk about what that would do for other industries um, if student debt was canceled? Uh, uh, Astra or Elizabeth, either one. Which one of you wants to take that? <laughs> I mean, I'll just quickly say there's research that says that canceling all student debt would be a $108 billion a year boost to the economy. Over 10 years, that's over a trillion dollars that would create over a, a million jobs a year. So certainly in COVID, we need this. But I think, I, you know, I would throw this question to Elizabeth and say, what would you spend your money on if you weren't paying back the student debt? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm currently pursuing a master's degree um, in policy precisely because I do want to um, have an impact in shaping um, these uh, these uh, these public matters, um, but obviously it would be amazing if I could pay for tuition out of pocket, right? Um, pay for tuition out of pocket. Uh, I've also uh, would have loved to again buy a home, right? Um, buy a home. Um, and coming from New York City, that's actually something that's really really impossible for uh, everyone in my in my income tax bracket. Um, unfortunately, five years out of college, um, uh, it would also mean that I could take on um, service work. Uh, I could work for the public sector like I wanted to. However, public sector um, salaries do not uh, make it so that I'm able to to pay my student loans um, uh, the the right way <laughs> by the law. I think the, uh, the 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 president of the or maybe it's the former president now of the Home Builders Association said uh, this was like two or three years ago now that the number one drag on new home ownership uh, or building rather was was student debt and and. Um, I, Elizabeth, just talk a little bit more about this dynamic of of what you would do. I mean, because this, I think, is sort of the hard thing to sort of qualitatively assess. What are we losing as a society in terms of quality people, people who are dedicated to all sorts of roles in society that don't pay enough money to pay off the debt? I mean, I, like, you know. The, I, I don't know how we can quali- you know, quantify or, or you know, quantify that, but that seems to me to be where it's almost like our own brain drain that we are inflicting upon ourselves. Yeah, um, I think that one really great way to kind of like speak to it quantitatively first is uh, just for um, for context. I uh, before I enrolled uh, in my master's program, I was paying about nine hundred dollars in student debt per month, um, both federal and um, private. And um, nine hundred dollars was the average rent in the Bronx, um, maybe like uh, like five years ago or so. Um, as you as you guys know, um, crowding in in New York City households is is a huge huge deal. Something that's affecting um, the the COVID nineteen pandemic specifically in my in my particular zip code. So that's that's one way to to qualify it, um, I guess. Uh, the second way is um, kind of like going back to like my personal history. Uh, I, I began my studies um, in, in journalism. I really wanted to be a journalist and, um, and write uh, investigative reporting, very similar to how you do, Sam. Um, and uh, when I graduated, I wasn't able to take on um, an offer for my first journalism job because uh, the, the pay was $28,000 uh, and I just simply couldn't afford that. Um, so of course I, I went in and I, I worked for the public relations field where uh, I was earning barely, <laughs> barely even a living wage at um, just under $45,000. Uh, again, not, not a living wage. And imagine somebody paying $900 a month um, on a, on a $45,000 salary. Um, so qualitatively, that's, that's kind of like speaking to, to how um, this impacts us. And, and it's, 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 I mean, it is, when, when you start to sort of like absorb the implications of this, when that only people who are coming from wealth can go into journalism. Only people who are coming from wealth can go into teaching, can go into social services. Um, and uh, it, the, you start to, to, to get a sense of, of 
of what it can do to a society and and to sort of like um, and how it builds upon itself over time. All right. So let's uh, let, let's do this, Astra. I want to like just present to you some of the arguments that I have heard uh, against this. Now, I, I should also say I just want to add into this um, that I just saw a report from the American Association of University Women that black women are the highest um, have the highest student debt. Uh, across the board, so they have fifty six percent more than than white men, which I would imagine is a function of of at least two things I can think of off the top of my head. One is obviously the um, the earnings power of men when they graduate uh, is greater even if they don't presumably uh, is is greater um, than women and and particularly women of color. Uh, and so they have the ability to pay it off so that they're not going you know, to double the interest, the, the amount that they have to pay off five years after college. And the other is, I think, when we talk about these for-profit universities, they're, um, they're a big, uh, not all of them, but the vast majority of them, their business plan is to target women of color who are not able to move through the job force and perceive that they need a college degree to get to the next level in their careers. And so they are often taken into these things. And one of these things these companies do, and, and I should say, you know, uh, we interviewed Tressie McMillan Cotton about this. I think it was uh, in two, maybe two years to the day, actually, uh, back in, in January of, of 19. They're, they don't provide you data. I'm like, hey, this is what your return on investment is. People just presume. And, and uh, you know, understandably so. All right, but, but give us a sense of, like, how is this fair, Astra? Like, what do you say to the person who says, like, well, I foregoed, you know, vacations and I paid it off or uh, or uh, and so I paid off my debt or this is only like a gift to, you know, wealthy people who can go to college. What do you say to that? Oh, I have some stuff to say to that because I do hear it a lot. First, I do want to say on your for-profit point, um, I would invite people to watch a film that is just up at the Intercept website, You Are Not Alone, that I made that uh, has a lot of stories about this and the Corinthian strike. It just went up today. So we hear this now. In fact, Betsy DeVos wrote a farewell letter. Farewell, Betsy. Um, and what she said was, don't listen to those people demanding full debt cancellation because it will be a handout to the wealthy. So it was a very funny thing for Betsy to say. This is a talking point these days that full student debt cancellation is regressive. It's not true. Student debt is regressive because the students of, uh, sorry, the, the children of billionaires and the children of millionaires don't have to borrow money to attend college, right? So already you've only got certain classes of people borrowing to go to school. And as you say, the burden falls most heavily on black women. They hold the most student debt because of a lack of intergenerational wealth and exactly wage discrimination and the existence of for-profit colleges. So there is research by lots of great economists, Derek Hamilton comes to mind saying, you want to have the maximum impact in terms of closing the racial wealth gap, cancel all the student debt. You want to have the most equity, cancel all the student debt. So this is something, um, you know, the research is pretty clear, but it's a popular talking point. I paid off my student loans. And the fact is, you know, I'm excited for people like Elizabeth and the rest of the Biden Jubilee 100 to be freed from these uh, debts. Just because I had to pay, I don't believe that other people should have to suffer under this. I think we will benefit as a society and as a democracy from a more fair system. The line I also often hear, which you, you got at very well, Sam, is well, what if some doctors or some lawyers get their, their loans canceled? You know, assuming that these are well-paid people selfishly pursuing their own ends. What you've illustrated is that many of them would go to public service. We know, for example, that there's a shortage of dentists in rural areas because they, people graduate from dentistry school with so much debt, they have to work in highly populated cities to pay those loans back. So we're all suffering and we'd all benefit from full cancellation. We'd have this economic boost. People would spend money in their communities. People could pursue public interest careers. It's a win-win for everyone. And Joe Biden can do it this afternoon. Well, well, you mentioned dentistry, and I, I thought about doctors and lawyers as well, and them being predominantly, probably, I'm sure the data bears this out, coming from wealthy backgrounds, um, and the trickle down that that effect has, right? So there, we have a lot of medical racism um, in this country. That could be an effect of the fact that a lot of 
people from wealthy families go into to pursuing being a doctor and other people might be discouraged because they just don't have the means um, to pursue those kinds of careers and lawyers as well. And, and um, can you t talk about some of those effects in, in cultures of um, professions where they have to pursue degrees that are so out of people's price ranges that they wouldn't even consider it altogether? Either of you. Yeah, in fact, one of the strikers, one of the Biden Jubilee 100 strikers is a doctor in Miami, Armin Henderson. He's part of the Dream Defenders, which is a great racial justice group in Florida. And he, his point is exactly what you're saying. He's saying, I come from a poor household and I had to, he owes $600,000 of student loans for his medical degree. He wants to serve people <laughs> as a physician. But again, this debt often drives people to specialize in certain types of medicine where they'll be higher paid instead of doing the work they want to do with the people who most need oh. equitable health care. Yeah. So it's, again, it's these perverse incentives that wind up happening. And for, for Armin, I know I can speak confidently that this is, a, this is an equity issue. This, is a, this gets the heart. This is one of the reasons that our medical system is so discriminatory and unfair. But $600,000. He'll never pay it off. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about to the the um, well. Let me ask. I guess, I guess both this. So uh, Elizabeth, your debt now is twice the amount of money that you borrowed. And like I say, in five years, I just find that just absolutely stunning. And um, do we have a sense of how much of that one point two uh, one point seven trillion dollars is just the profit that the U.S. government is going to be making on this? I've never seen that written. I've never seen that broken down, but that's a brilliant point that we should we should get the research on that. Absolutely. The point is also that 1.7 trillion, again, as I said, it was 1 trillion on one T-Day in 2011. So we are racing towards 2 trillion uh, rapidly. So we get a sense of it in that scale of growth. All right, let's talk about the, the other aspect of this, which I think is really important. It's that um, you don't want to, uh, you know, close the barn door, as it were, when we talk about the the uh, the opportunity for an option for free university in every state. And let's be very clear about this, because I've actually like interviewed some people who were, you know, I, I can't remember this specific instance, but uh, people assumed like it would be ridiculous to have the U.S. government, you know, pay for Harvard University's um uh, tuition for everybody. That's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking, when we say free college, we're, we're saying everyone has the opportunity to go to a university, presumably in each state, um, that is free, that you have the opportunity to go there. You know, you can go to other private institutions. We want to pay more. Right. But I mean, if it, that's what we're talking about, yes. Yeah. Elizabeth, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what a difference that would make for your generation. Yeah. Yeah. I can actually speak to the instance of New York City, um, my home state. Um, New York did try to enact um, a free college uh, for all, um, very popular to, um, or rather very similar to um, other schemes that have been implemented in other states. However, uh, uh, the it does bar um, like uh, like earnings uh, at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, et cetera, uh, but the the research has shown that only about three percent of uh, of folks have been able to um, to enroll in that, and it does the it does come saddled with a bunch of um, different caveats around um, having to like live in the state and like work in the state for um, five years plus. So um, even like the current schemes that that um, our policy interventions meant to address this are still not comprehensive enough um, as as would be just free college for all. Um, I know several people who have left the country um, because they're unable to, to pay their student loans. Um, and I know people that have dropped out of school um, because they're unable to, to pay for school. Um, and that's a reality for a lot of uh, a, a lot of black and Latino folks. So it and, would be and, there, in that situation, what happens is you accrue a certain amount of, uh, of debt. You can't go all the way in college because you, you can't afford anymore. But then you go back out into the job market and your opportunities are limited because you haven't gotten a graduate degree. And so the, that number you know, grows and grows. Well, let me ask you this. How, pro, how problematic would it have been, Elizabeth, if you were forced to have gone to if you had the opportunity to go to a, a free university in, in New York State and there was a couple of billionaire kids in your class. I mean, do, like, do we really think as a society that would be a bad thing? 
that if our billionaire class or our multimillionaire class went to school with, you know, the, I guess the the plebes would be a problem. I mean, I th- isn't this like what? How could that be a bad thing in any situation? And the amount of benefit our society would get from that seems to be exponential. I mean, I, you know, uh, d- d- we, OK, we paid for two billionaires kids to go to college. Uh, Right. Actually, I think that that's um, people often uh, make that make that like false equivalence, right? That like if a really large amount of folks are benefiting from something um, and like a small amount of folks in this case would be benefiting from something that they're sort of so, so quote unquote not um, entitled to. Uh, does that does the fact that like two billionaires kids um, going to, to school for free, does that outweigh the fact that several million um, kids who aren't able to, to afford school. Uh, are we going to like not do that because it would just benefit two, two kids? I don't think that that makes any sense. So I wholly disagree with that. Well, it's such a paper thin excuse. I mean, uh, it, it reminds me of Mitch McConnell, who was just arguing against relief payments on the Senate floor, saying this is only going to benefit rich people. And then you look into it for one second and it's go- no, this would broadly benefit people who couldn't afford college in this instance, obviously. Exactly. I think COVID makes this so much more important, though, because we also are facing a bigger crisis of universities at this moment. And what we what COVID showed among, you know, taught us a lot. But one thing is that the only sustainable source of revenue for our educational institutions, which are critical for society, is public funding, because, you know, students didn't want to enroll. So tuition went down. Universities were building all these big stadiums, hoping to get revenue for through sports. They were building these fancy apartment, you know, dorm complexes, hoping to get revenue through that and engaging in all these schemes when it's like, let's just do the simple thing. Let's fund public schools with public money. And yes, maybe we'll cut down on some of the bells and whistles, right, that these fancy colleges have. But, you know, I think the fact is that, you know, we can we, we focus too much on the Harvards, which, you know, serves a couple thousand students <laughs> instead of thinking about what it would be like to go back to the original vision that informed the California system uh, in the middle of the 20th century, the CUNY system, which was built to be free for working class students. You know, we have a model and that's why there's college for all legislation that was introduced. It's gonna be reintroduced in a couple months that basically um, gets, figures this out and would would I think be um, a dramatic improvement for students from all walks of life and more sustainable and robust when a crisis hits. And I just uh, lastly, just so that we're sort of like, you know, um, um, uh, covering all of the, the, the bases here. Um, I have not seen and I'm curious about the, the proposal that you're talking about. I have not seen a proposal for a free option of college in every state that does not include a similar uh, parallel um, um, funding for vocational things. Um, for vocational studies, as opposed to you know, um, you know, liberal arts uh, university, is that right, Astra? Well, the, the College for All bill makes all public colleges at two and four year institutions. So a lot of two year institutions are you know focused on associate degrees and more vocational. So I think what it does though is it allows people to go for that bigger four year degree if that's what they want. You know, College for All who want it, we could say it is, and uh, and I think that you know. It's important that people have a vocational option, but what we've done, I think part of what student debt has done is it's forced us to think of education strictly in terms of job training, because what happens when you have so much student debt is all you need is that job at the end to pay back your debt. And so we are also robbing people of the ability to take that longer time to learn, to explore, to acquire those insights they might need to be, as you said, citizens in a democracy. So I, I think vocational training is important, should be subsidized too, but we should also give working people the opportunity to have four years to, um, you know, to be students. Lastly, Elizabeth, I want you to just give us a sense of like, how big of an issue is this with, with your contemporaries? I mean, like, you know, how, how much does this dominate the conversation and I mean, I would imagine on some level, like social lives. Um, I mean, everything on some level, because you've got this sort of massive cloud hanging over you um, 24-7. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know a single person without student debt. Um, uh, just from, from my social network, I don't, I don't know anyone. Um, and it, it's just, it, it is something that we talk about constantly because it, it impacts so many aspects of our lives, right? If we go back to the housing question, there are folks who are unable um, to pay for their living situation without uh, without getting um, their refunds, their refunds from from their loans. 
uh, students do depend fully on, on, on funding like to, to go about their lives. So it's, it's, very, it's very big, it's very big. And that's part of the reason why I got involved with the Debt Collective um, because this, this issue does need to be organized broadly, um, as broadly as possible. Again, this issue is a lot bigger um, than the 2008 crisis. So um, Astra, if people want to get involved in the uh, Biden Jubilee 100 campaign, what do they do? I mean, what are the different sort of levels of involvement? Uh, can they be, can, can, is, is it too late for you to, to go on debt strike? Uh, or, I mean, what? Tell, tell us. The well, very- yeah, one thing we want to do is politicize non-payment. Before COVID, a million plus people were defaulting on their student loans every year. I defaulted back when I had student loans. We're trying to also say, don't do that ashamed and isolated. Join this political movement. So, you know, the fight is likely not going to end at the uh, end of these 100 days. So go to debtcollective.org. Um, join the union. That's what we need to have power in numbers because our debts overwhelm us individually, but together we can overwhelm the system. So there's petitions to sign, there's calls to join. Obviously we are organizing in a pandemic context. So a lot of stuff is virtual. So if people wanna get involved in this, they can immediately uh, go to debtcollective.org and there's meetings throughout the week. Uh, Astra Taylor, Elizabeth Alvarez, thank you so much guys. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, it it's just sort of stunning to me that People could be aware of this, know how easy it is for Joe Biden to do this. Um, and 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 like we don't even know, like just wave off this one point seven trillion. That's that's supposedly amortized at least like 30, 40 years out anyways. Uh, a huge percentage of that is um, is interest. And we could just rid our society of this problem like with a stroke of a pen. It just seems stunning to me. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break and we'll be back in just a moment to wrap things up. 